You know, I think I think an audience, you know, really is always going to be taken in by the story. I really believe that the context of how a creature appears in a film or in a in any kind of production is going to enhance, you know, the qualities of that character. So it goes without saying that if you're overcompensating for a very thin plot line and, and weak characters, if you're overcompensating by having, you know, faster vehicles and bigger explosions and, you know, thicker steel doors that are being punched through and, uh, you know, then then the audience is, um, is going to be disappointed, but they may not even know if they're not sensing it that they're disappointed by the context that's not allowing there to be a good experience, you know, with the creature on, on screen. Um, so I just think that empathy is everything, you know, it's like with any creature. Um, I find it fascinating that it, you know, that if you observe a real animal, whether it be a pet in your home or a creature at the zoo or something in the wild, it's never dull. I mean, you don't feel bored watching a dog, you know, do something funny, like suddenly sniff, look up, ear goes up, wakes up, goes back to sleep, makes a little sad sound or something. Um, if you're in the woods and you're watching, you know, just, you know, a deer, you know, passing through, you never feel like, oh, this is so boring, it's just a deer, you know. There's a fascination because it feels like anything can happen. And so I feel like that if, if a creature is allowed to appear on screen and you're, and the filmmaker, the director, you know, the whole production allows there to be a context in which it can a- appear in an original way, I think then the audiences will hang in there and be fascinated by it. Uh, I'm, you know, I would love to see a long, lingering, unedited shot, tracking shot of like a fascinating character that's maybe human, like almost suit operated, but really well done. Exploring a space, moving through a room, I think people would, would watch that. But what's happened is that everyone's a little bit worried that it won't hold up, you know, because a lot of heavy animatronics or CGI stuff, so there's a lot of cutaways, a lot of weird shadow effects to kind of hide the fact that it's not real. And you get into this whole jump cut, um, typical, you know, it's scored for this kind of, you know, to accompany the jump cuts, you're getting all this production, which feels like every other movie you've seen. And that's where people are sort of saying like, well, show me, show me something. Because what they may not be able to articulate to themselves is that this is familiar. I know exactly what's going to happen. And so then when you feel that way, you're like, I want to see something that's going to blow my mind when I see the creature's face. That's almost like putting too much pressure. Creature can be more subtle, but really well performed in a really great emotional context where you're going to sort of feel pity or, or be frightened by it or be worried about the person that's going to encounter this creature. Just like if you were on vacation and your you know, wacky dad was going to go and try to pet a bear in the wild. You know, while you're watching that footage, anybody watching this footage without knowing what happens is going to be sitting with bated breath. Like, is that bear going to take a swipe at the person? And you're always thinking, my God, why are you doing this? That's an animal that could kill you if it decided to. And there's that same tension when you see uh, big cats in the circus. Like, they're just sitting there and they can look tired and lazy in some sort of sad circus, but you, you're aware that in an instant, everything could change. And I think that if someone approaches a creature with the same respect that you would, the magic and potential of a wild, real animal, I think that that would change the pressure so that the fabricators can just make really well-constructed creatures that are used in a better way. So that's that's my angle, because as a performer, and not working in a big level in the film industry, um, I'm involved with projects where you know there's not the kinds of budgets where you can hide and mask all this stuff and put effects on things. And so the idea is you want to get the, the best performance you can in the can and the best use of the suit or the special effect. When I watch how that stuff is made, you know, I find it to be fascinating because it is getting back to the idea of performance-driven um, characters. You know, that a human being is is creating this persona through this incredible, you know, technological advancement in, in motion capture. And um, I have to say that for me, I'm I'm learning about that. You know, I don't I don't work in that field. I don't I haven't had the um, you know, the opportunity uh, 
to collaborate with uh, technology in that level. Um, and I'm really eager to because my um, feeling is that it's amazing what's being done using a human being that's got different, you know, sort of readable reference points on their body that, you know, that the equipment is, is gauging motion from. But I would love to propose that a sort of a weird hybrid where someone is wearing prosthetics, wearing body parts, um, and letting the sculpture of the costume be captured. Uh, so that you get this unique performance of the person struggling against the, uh, I mean, I say struggle, it's a creative struggle, but struggling and and working with the challenges of the costume. It changes the way you move. If you're wearing something that weighs, you move differently. And if your breathing is constricted, this can be a plus in terms of original movement for a creature. So I like the idea of someone's in a suit, part prosthetic, part digitized, you know, motion capture and create a new hybrid, uh, a new kind of motion because I think that the artificial parts of the human form there will will create a much more, I don't know, a more, a, a more honest, uh, more honest invention on screen. Um, but I'm, I'm blown away by what's done. I just think that it's also falling into this category of it's being done so well and you're seeing it more and more in different films that I fear that audiences are just starting to settle into this um, feeling that in the movies everything is possible and therefore they cease being in awe of it because they it's still so apart from their reality and I think that when something is a bit more clunky it's fascinating you know I'm I mean I was having a conversation the other day with some of the the guys who were working in, you know, really sophisticated motion capture. And my argument was that if there's going to be a another Godzilla movie, wouldn't it be fantastic to just sort of announce to the world that we're going rubber suit with this, but it's going to be the best damn rubber suit performance you ever saw. You know, we're working with the absolute most incredible performance movement people in rubber suits that are going to be then enhanced in some way. And when you watch this giant monster stomp through the city, the audience will be like, yes, this is a different kind of monster because there's a person in a suit and that will always make someone watch very carefully. I mean, I'm not talking about the dark side, not the dark side, but like the ridiculous side of rubber suits, you know, the rubbery, ridiculous sort of uh, banana splits kind of, uh, you know, nonsense, but I mean, fun nonsense, but I mean, it was insane, crazy stuff where they're hyperactive mascots. I'm talking about the other realm. Can you take that and make it a high art again where the, this is a superstar. A person can kind of wear this stuff and, you know, cut. That was a beautiful take. And, you know, actors are dealing with a real person in the room. And, you know, that's why I really like the way that Where the Wild Things um, are was done. Because I think that the choice of actually having, you know, performers in those giant costumes, which then had you know, different computer-generated images for the faces, the blinking eyes and the expressions on the face were all done in post-production. But there was basically giant creatures in those shoots. People were in costumes. And the young actor in that movie, if you watch that performance, it's just so genuine that in the theater, people are just like, you, you're reacting, whether you know it or not, to the fact that there's such a genuine connection between the beasts, you know, the wild things, and Max in that movie, and it it's really it really affected me. I mean, it made me emotionally tied in, and I think re later on I realized it's because it was happening, you know, in front of the camera. I think that the best way to prepare and to begin the conversation for establishing, you know, really good motion and engaging audiences in a, in, in a kind of a creature mode is to take it to the real world, you know. I mean, I got my start, you know, making really cool Halloween costumes. You know, I was really driven to kind of create great pieces when I went out, you know, to a party. And then started winning prizes and all that stuff. But the thing that got me involved in this business was that the transformation, the, you know, the trans being able to transform your physical self and to also transform environments by being something other than a human being 
was so interesting and so engaging and the success completely depended upon your complete commitment to the transformation. So the idea is that if you go to a party and you're sort of wearing your costume sort of in a half-ass smirky, you know, snarky, like, yeah, I know I'm, I'm wearing a costume, but it's really me, you know, and you lift it up and you drink your drink and then you put it back on and then as soon as someone interesting comes in, you're wearing it backwards on your head. Uh, you know, you all, you know, you know how you would feel about that. It'd be sort of like, that is just a headgear, you know. I think it just comes down to, you know, the old costume venues, Halloween parties, parades, carnivals, mascots, anywhere that uh, we're used to seeing people in costume, um, there's always those who take it to another level. I mean, I'm talking about even folks who are waving outside of car washes saying, you know, come to this car wash. I'm, I'm wearing, for some reason, a giant frog costume. Um, you know, if the person looks like they're hating it, they're lazy, their posture is that their legs, they're standing just like a person in a suit, their hands collapse when they're not waving, when they wave with disinterest, you just feel like, I'm seeing the person in a suit, they must be hot, and you start talking about that. Um, that can get you tackled and beat up as well, because kids love to uh, take down mascots who they think are lame, and it's because they think there's a lame person inside of it, and that's why. But if this frog person who's waving at people in the streets is hopping about, has the nuances of actually in, experiencing its environment, meaning it hears something it turns to look at, or it chooses to ignore it, or it looks again and gives it a double take, like it's remembering you and it's going to get back to you in a second after it waves at this car. I mean, if it does these little nuanced things, people stop and start to watch this and go, this is different. I'm watching this theatrical expression. This character is coming to life. Despite your own desire to put it down, to say it's fake, you start getting sucked into it. And it's because when a person is committed to their transformed state, it evokes respect. Um, you know, I've had, you know, the honor of actually experiencing like a trance performance when I was in Bali, Indonesia, in a small village where, you know, an individual is prepared over time, and it's also part of the religious ceremony through fasting, etc., to become, you know, to, to become the voice of, of a spirit um, that speaks from the other side. And uh, when this person is out there and in that state, everybody is completely, you know, in awe, and they are receptive to every little nuance of what occurs, and they also fear the performer and in that state. And when it's over, and they're drawn out of it, and they're back amongst their community, it's not like that person was the person in the costume, because the transformation is so complete that it taps into a primal understanding in all human beings that everyone has the potential to be something other than who they are. And, you know, we all know that inside of each person there's a hero. There's also a villain. We know from reading the newspapers that there's incredible acts of transcendence where human beings have given their own lives to help another person uh, and losing their own in the process. And also the most unimaginable horrific acts where you wonder how could a human being have done this to another human being or could do something like this. So when a person is completely devoted to their transformed state, whether it be a hand puppet to a goofy clown dog, to a creature that's covered with scales in a movie, if the performer really goes beyond the call of duty and is tapped into some sort of deep animal logic, it just comes across. And I think that evokes respect or at least fascination. And when I'm training people, what I do is put them in situations of danger. I don't mean physical danger, but like danger of self-identity. They're suddenly in public, they're wearing a costume, they can't be themselves, yet they don't really fully know who they are. It is the most, it is the weirdest feeling. You have to try it. You know that you're getting all this attention. People are looking at you. You're the person with the big green head on or the strange paws and the, you know, the costume. So you know that everyone is looking at you and you know that they're all like wondering in seconds, are you worth looking at for another second? Or am I going to heckle you? Or am I going to ignore you completely? Which, you know, it hurts. I mean, you know, they just walk by. They haven't even noticed you. So there's all this judgment. or you, And so you have to rise up to the challenge. And repeat uh, expeditions like this and opportunities to be put into this delicate position make the performer or the student really want the training, 
Like you come out of that and you go, okay, I've got to know, you know, how to how to how to engage, or I've got to know what to do when someone does this, or uh, how can I be more convincing? Why are people laughing at me? And that, you know, um, how can I be less scary? Why is every child crying when they see me when I'm there to be, you know, inviting them into the magic uh, forest? You know, and every one of those problems has a very nuanced, interesting you know, answer that is very, the journey to that answer is almost like spiritual training. It's like self-awareness. It's like it actually helps you in your own personal life, you know, because you realize that you can, you can telepathically signal from a distance how people should perceive you. From a distance, they will approach you with a certain attitude if you have certain physical signals. And this is not like people are trained to read these signals. It's an animal instinct. It's you know, when you sort of see the, the you know, you, I mean, I've seen this most in documentaries and sometimes in farm settings where there's a wounded or a sick animal, which seems to, you know, kind of absorb punishment or bad behavior from other creatures. You know, they instinctively want to reject the bleeding member of its group. I mean, I know that chickens are supposedly very cruel to each other. If one is bleeding, they all peck at it or something. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe it's not chickens. Maybe it's uh, Cornish hens. But the idea is that there's um, there's this feeling that in the herd, if something is doesn't fit, it's rejected. It's you know it's kind of like and so when you're a creature performer, you are the exception, and you have to fight your way back into belonging. And if you're not supposed to belong you better really not belong. You know, you can't sort of not belong because I'm a person in the suit, that's why I'm different than you. It's gonna be like, no, I'm a friggin' monster. In your, I know that, you know, it makes no sense. You're in a bank lobby, hopefully not a bank lobby. You're not supposed to really wear costumes in a bank lobby, but let's say you're just in some place and there's an inexplicable person in a costume who's doing a damn good job. You, you know, if you're really good, people's suspension of disbelief will kick in and they will become frightened or they will be like, what is happening? Or they will be cautious or they will approach you or they will run up and hug you. It all depends on the person. It's a whole other subject, what you pull out of people when you do this convincingly.